Helion Energy, a fusion energy startup, recently announced that it's raised $425 million in a Series F round. At Helion, we're building fusion generators. Fusion is the process that happens in the sun. You're about to walk into a place that barely lets anyone through the front door. We drove to Everett, Washington, to visit Helion, a fusion startup that feels like a spy lab. One wrong step, and yes, you could get hurt, because this is high voltage science, packed into giant metal lungs. Helion says it can solve the biggest energy problem on Earth, clean power that never sleeps. People doubt them. People laugh at them. That's why this visit matters, because if Helion is right, the future gets brighter faster than anyone expects. And if they're wrong, we learn why today. Everett's locked door. We roll up to Helion with equal parts excitement and nerves. Helion does not love visitors. The company is private, intense, and oddly proud of being hard to read. That makes the parking lot feel like a checkpoint. Inside, the air smells like metal and fresh wiring. David Kirtley, Helion's CEO and co-founder, meets us with a calm voice and a quick grin. Some people call him brilliant, some call him reckless. He does not seem bothered by either label. He started Helion back in 2013, and the company has since raised more than a billion dollars to chase fusion, including backing tied to Sam Altman and other big names. That kind of funding buys attention, and it also buys skepticism. Fusion has broken hearts for decades, and Helion has a reputation for being the bad boy of the field. Shows too little, and promises too much. Helion leans into that tension. Critics complain the company is too secretive. They say it publishes too little. They show you hardware first, not papers. David walks us past earlier machines and tells us, without much drama, that the goal is not a science fair win. The goal is a generator that makes electricity people can actually use. Fusion 101 without the fairy tale. Before you can judge Helion, you need to understand the basic problem in plain language. Fusion is what powers the sun. You take light atoms, like forms of hydrogen, and force them to join. When they fuse, you get helium, and you get energy. The catch is that the atoms fight you. Their positive charges repel each other, as two magnets push together. To get past that repulsion, you need extreme heat, so the atoms move fast enough to collide. We are talking about around 100 million degrees Celsius. At that temperature, nothing is solid. The fuel becomes plasma, a hot soup of charged particles. Now, you must hold that plasma in place without letting it touch the walls, because the walls would cool it instantly, and the plasma would damage the reactor. So you use magnetic fields, like invisible rails. Even then, fusion has one brutal scoreboard, energy in versus energy out. For most of history, reactors have consumed more energy than they produced. That is why fusion gets called the Holy Grail, and David hates that phrase because it sounds like a quest with no ending. Helion's bet is simple to say, and hard to do. Make a machine that crosses the line into net energy gain, and do it in a compact, repeatable way. The rebel move. Electricity first. Most fusion projects chase heat. They plan to make fusion, harvest heat, boil water, spin a turbine. Helion wants to skip the steam era. Their pitch is direct electricity, and send power to the grid like a cleaner coal plant. Here is the picture David keeps returning to. First, Helion injects fuel, then turns it into plasma. That plasma gets shaped and squeezed by magnetic fields inside a long chamber. Instead of treating that push as a problem, Helion treats it like a generator. The expanding plasma pushes back against the magnetic field. When fusion happens, the charged particles and the hot plasma push outward. That changing magnetic field induces an electric current in the coils around the chamber. In Helion's ideal world, the machine captures that electric current and routes it straight back to its capacitor banks, then out to useful loads. David points out that some parts of their electromagnetic system can be very efficient, citing figures around the mid-90% range for certain coils. He contrasts that with approaches that may achieve fusion events, and it has a sharp advantage if it works. Fewer steps, less wasted heat, and a smaller plant footprint.
but it also raises the stake, but recover little or no electricity from the reaction itself, forcing them to make up losses elsewhere. It is an ambitious idea, because the machine must do physics and power electronics at the same time, at insane speeds. From Grande to Trenta. Iteration as a weapon. Hellion's floor feels like a museum where every exhibit can still bite you. David shows us the earlier machines with the pride of someone who prefers proof over speeches. They once named systems after Starbucks sizes, partly as a joke and partly as a reminder that progress can be measured in upgrades. Grande was a smaller machine that helped them show fusion conditions were possible on their path. David says it set notable records for fusion temperatures in its class. Then came Venti, built with stronger compression fields so the system could squeeze the plasma harder. That set the stage for Trenta, a bigger, tougher step. David lets us peer down the bore of Trenta, the tunnel where two plasmas are meant to meet. If everything works, those plasmas collide and form a hotter, denser core, and temperatures can reach into the tens of millions of degrees. Along the way, Hellion ran test after test. The first goal was simply to make fusion events happen. The next goal was control, shaping the magnetic fields, timing the pulses, and measuring telltale signs that energy was moving the way their models predicted. Hellion claims Trent approved two key points for them. One, they could reach thermonuclear conditions. Two, they could pull electricity back out of the reaction through their magnetic setup. Each machine in David's telling is not a finished product. It is a question asked in steel and copper, with the answer coming back as data. Inside Ursa. Power, procedure, and doubt. Next, Next we, we step into a building called Ursa, and the mood shifts from tour to warning. Before we go near the real hardware, Hellion runs us through a safety ritual called Lockout Tagout. A key that controls the power supplies is physically locked away in a box, so nobody can energize the system while people are inside. Everyone follows the same rule every time. It is not a theater. It is survival. David points to the power supplies for Polaris, and then to a capacitor bank holding over 60 megajoules of stored energy. He calls it the largest magnetic pulse power bank on the planet. Whether or not that claim holds forever, it is clearly massive. This is the hidden side of fusion that never makes the glossy posters. You are not only doing plasma physics, you are also moving bursts of electricity that can jump, arc, and destroy. Helion skeptics argue that none of this matters if the core claim fails. They want peer-reviewed papers, detailed results, and independent confirmation. Some also say Helion leans too much on builders, and not enough on elite fusion PhDs. David pushes back. He says top scientists and high-voltage engineers are crucial and Helion has them. But he also says that speed comes from a tight loop. Build, test, break, fix, and learn. In his view, a shop that can iterate fast is not a shortcut around science. It is the engine of science. Polaris, Orion, and the future on a deadline. Then David does the thing Helion rarely does. He lets us see Polaris, not the public not the whole world, just a close look that feels like being handed a secret. From the balcony, Polaris is huge, even though Hellion says it is smaller than many rivals. Cables pour through a wall and plug into the machine like veins into a heart. Someone jokes they buy cable by the megameter, a thousand kilometers at a time, and it suddenly sounds realistic. David tells us that when Polaris fires, it glows a bright fuchsia pink as it superheats hydrogen and helium. Fuel is puffed in like a rocket injector, then ionized, then accelerated towards the center. The pulse is violent and fast. In about one thousandth of a second, energy rushes in through the coils, the plasma compresses, fusion conditions flare, and energy comes back out. Helion aims to recover that energy as electricity, recharge the capacitors, and fire again. Bang in, bang out, over and over. Normal cameras cannot catch the plasma racing down the chamber, but high-speed cameras can, and the footage looks like controlled lightning. David admits the grind is messy. 
They run tests, upgrade systems, push higher power, and some days they break things. Hellion will not show Polaris openly, citing intellectual property worries and the feeling that competitors, including China, are always watching. Polaris was once expected to be producing electricity in 2024, and Hellion is now behind that timeline. David also will not yet say if Polaris makes more energy than it consumes. Still, Hellion is building the next machine, Orion, in Malaga, Washington. They say Orion will run in 2028, and Microsoft has signed on as the first customer. If it works, David imagines factories turning out fusion generators for AI data centers, for grids, and for places that need clean, always on power. We leave Hellion with two ideas fighting in my head. One is in doubt because fusion has trained us to doubt. Promising is easy. Delivering power is brutal. The other is awe because Hellion is not selling drawings. They are building machines you can stand under. Machines that demand lockout keys and miles of cable, and machines that glow pink when they fire. David Kirtley might be a madman, but maybe that is required to make fusion real. Until a reactor proves net energy, the story stays unfinished. Even the sponsor pitch, Brex, feels tame here. Still, I'm glad we went.